All right, Bible readers, today is 2 Timothy chapter 1, and I'm going to summarize it. And the question is, how do you stir up the gift of God that is in you? How do you stir up the gift of God that is in you? So we're going to get into that soon, but let's get started with verse 1. Paul opens the book like he opens all of his books with his first name, Paul. And then he gives almost like a, a credential, a short credential list. An apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. So I'm going to give you a little hint to where I'm going here. This promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, is given to all of those who trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the promise. Verse 2, to Timothy. Okay, so there's no question who Paul's writing to here. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son. Okay, this is a another indicator. It's not the first time Paul has written like this in regards to Timothy. He refers to him as a son. It's a spiritual relationship that they have together. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. This also suggests how we should think about people that we care about. Okay, so I believe there's a relationship between what's written in verse 1 according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, and Ephesians 3, 6, which says partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. See that similar language and that clarity of the gospel? Let's keep going. Verses 3 through 5 is one sentence. So basically, um, the first five verses of this chapter constitute two sentences. So just Keep that in, in your mind for a moment. Verse three, I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, yet Paul was a murderer. So how could he say that he, that he served God from his forefathers with a pure conscience? Well, I think the short answer here is that when he was doing the things that he was doing as a Pharisee, which involved murder <clears throat> and other things. You know, he was imprisoning people, having people stoned, all kinds of things. But he, would, he can say here that he did it with a pure conscience simply because that's what he believed was the right thing to do as a Jewish Pharisee at the time. So he wasn't, he wasn't breaking any laws particularly. Okay, let's, let's keep moving. That without ceasing, I have a remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Again, this is a consistent theme of Paul's, this idea of praying without ceasing, um, you know, night and day prayers, that kind of thing. It's a very consistent theme for him. Verse four, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. See, Paul often expresses that his, um, like his experience in life, is direct, directly related to the nature of the experience of others that he cares about. You know, you, you can easily say Paul was an empath. You know, in other words, what other people experienced, good, bad, or otherwise, he felt that. He was very empathetic. And he wasn't afraid of expressing his emotions in regards to how he felt about people that he was overseeing or cared about. Verse five, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in me, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Okay, so unfeigned faith. If you're not sure what unfeigned means or the word feign, it's kind of like, a, it has to do with like faults, um, kind of the idea of putting up pretenses. So do a word study on that if you want to get a deeper meaning of that. All right, so look, here's, here's what we know about 2 Timothy, is that all the, all the available evidence indicates that there was two to five years between the first letter to Timothy and the second one that we're reading now. There's also no biblical or other evidence that Paul ever saw Timothy again. And so in verse 4, when he says, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears. Now think about it. This letter, unlike the first letter to Timothy, this letter is um, written 
while he's imprisoned in Rome. And it's not like the first time he was imprisoned in Rome. The first time he was imprisoned in Rome, he had a lot of freedom. Uh, people could come and go. And, you know, it was it was like, uh, you know, the day spa of prison, so to speak. Uh, I'm sure it wasn't exactly present because it was still ancient Rome and, and all that. But by comparison to now, there's a different kind of tenor to, to the way he's expressing things. He's talking about his chains and he, he just doesn't have the freedom of movement that he had before. So again, I guess I'm telling you all this because when you read, when you read verses or when you read words, it's good to kind of have some understanding of like what was going on around Paul at that time. What, what was the nature of the environment and, and that, that would kind of be affecting his, his thoughts and his feelings. Okay, so he's writing this letter while in chains and things in Rome are digressing rapidly. I'll get into that more in a minute. So just, just let, let it sink in, you know, because again, it, it, it impacts the way that when you read the Bible, you know, like, are you really experiencing it and feeling it and understanding what, what's kind of going on around, or are you just reading you know, words on a page or words on a, on a digital device and not really understanding anything that you're reading and maybe, maybe trying to, you know, look, I'm going to tell you right now, reading the Bible out of some kind of obligation of guilt will never work. It just won't. And even if you somehow muscle your way all the way through it, uh, your understanding, what you gain from that experience is going to be extremely limited. So I would encourage you to, to really apply yourself. And that's why I talk about these kinds of things in these chapter summaries, because my, my overriding goal is that people that name the name of Christ would actually read the entire words of God. So let's keep going. Okay. So also in second Timothy or second Timothy may have been Paul's last letter. So, you know, again, I don't ascribe to scholarship too much, but it is good to, at least have some sources to maybe answer or suggest some of these kinds of questions. And so the consensus is, is that this was probably the last letter that Paul wrote. So even though Titus and Philemon come next in the order of the books, because that's the way I believe God wanted it preserved, this was probably his last letter that he wrote. And it certainly has that feel to it. You can tell that Paul's at the end of his life. Um, and so second Timothy is purported to have been written sometime between 66 and 67 AD. And the evidence is strong that Paul was beheaded by Nero in AD 67. So what does all that mean? Well, not, not anything necessarily, um, other than just to kind of understand where Paul was at in his timeline. And I'm sure Paul knew that he was close to the end. So as we read through this letter, we're going to see, okay, now not only is just this chapter, but I'm talking about, you know, Second Timothy as a complete letter. We're going to see that Paul's language, um, or we're going to see in his language that he was, he was aware that, you know, probably the end of his life was near. Uh, he had been brought before Nero again, and there was increasing hostilities in Rome toward this thing that, you know, they refer to as Christianity. Even though Paul never used that word, that's how people, you know, that's how kind of the world referred to these people that were lifting up the name of Christ. All right, verse six. Verse six is going to be kind of the hinge point of this entire chapter summary. And so I've highlighted one word in particular, wherefore. It's an important word to understand grammatically. I'll get into that here in a minute. Let's just read it. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Okay, so that's where I come up with a question, you know, about stirring up the gift of God that's in you. Paul is exhorting Timothy to remember to stir up the gift of God, which is in him. So first, let's get clear on what Paul is referring to here as the gift of God. Let's start by looking at the first word of the verse, uh, of verse six, which is wherefore. In grammar, a word like wherefore is a conjunction, 
which means it is used to connect clauses or sentences. In this case, I think it means it, it you know, it's pretty clear to me at any rate to be connecting the previous two sentences, which is verse, you know, the first sentence is um, verse one and two, and the second sentence is verse three through five. Okay, and that's why, again, this is this is another reason why I often, um, instead of breaking up the the verses just by just by verse, I often you know clump together the sentences so that we have, um, because here's the thing to think about: when Paul wrote his letters, he's not the man that came up with verses; he was writing sentences. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with these verses. I'm not saying it wasn't part of God's preservation. I'm not saying anything like that. I'm just saying that for our understanding of grammar, it's good to acknowledge where the sentence breaks are. Okay, so that's all I'm saying. Uh, all right, so in verse one, Paul refers to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. This is another way of expressing the gospel. You know, when we trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are given the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. This is the gift of eternal life. So I believe this is the same gift of God, which is, which is eternal life that we all receive upon trusting in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So um, I should have just read my notes instead of ad-libbing, but that's the idea. The promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. We're talking about eternal life here. This is a gift. So let's look at some excerpts from other verses that speak of this same gift. I'm not going to read the references, but what I want to what I want to do is just read again. Like I said, these are excerpts. Go, you know, go look up the entire verses if you want. But it, here's the language: the free gift, the gift by grace, the free gift, the gift of righteousness, the free gift, the gift of God is eternal life. Very very plain language here. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Yeah, try, try to explain everything that you get by becoming a child of God. I'll wait. <laughs> I'm kidding. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if somebody put you on the spot and said, hey, explain to me everything that you get when you became a child of God? Uh, I I'm going to tell you that as, as somebody that's read the Bible a few times and studied it for a bunch of years, I would be hard pressed to cover everything that I got. And then, and then to presume that I could somehow describe the gift of God being eternal life and explain everything that that means. I mean, come on, how am I going to do that? You know, I might reside spiritually in heavenly places, but can I describe eternity to you? Can I describe eternal life to you? No, it's, it's, like the word says, it's unspeakable. Now I can speak of some of it, but I can't begin to speak of all of it. All right, back to this list. Ephesians, the gift of God, the gift of the grace of God, the gift of Christ, the gift that is in thee. So clearly the reference above, the references above are not references to the spiritual gifts written of in these verses. In Romans, spiritual gift, to the end ye may be established. Now concerning the spiritual gifts, diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same spirit, spiritual gifts. And then the last one is 1 Corinthians 14, spiritual gifts. See, there's a clarity, there's a distinction between this gift of eternal life and these other spiritual gifts. Okay, so that's that's something I wanted to you know clarify real quick or right up front before we dive deeper into this gift. Let me go back up to the top. Um, or I'm sorry, verse six. So before we dive deeper, we are talking about Paul, uh, you know, challenging or maybe exhorting Timothy to remember to stir up the gift of God which is in them, and by extension, which is in us. Because we're talking about the promise, um, the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. That's, that's, that's what I believe is the gift of God. Okay. 
So let's go back. Let's go back right here. Okay, so I've got I've got a few questions for you. If you've been around my content at all, you know I like to ask questions. By the way, I like to be asked questions, so don't hesitate to ask me questions. Um, all right, so think about when you first became a child of God, whether you know maybe you were young. In my case, I was young. Maybe you were an adult. Did you ever think of yourself as being zealous? You know, just looking back at, at when you first got saved, did, did you think of yourself as zealous? Or did anyone ever call you a zealot or, you know, say, oh, you're on fire for the Lord? I'm not, I'm not promoting that term, by the way. Nowhere in the Bible does, you know, is, is anybody as a child of God ever referred to as being on fire? Okay, so I'm not sure why people say that. But that's, that's a term or a phrase that people like to use when somebody is being zealous um, or any other kind of term. Did, you know, did, when you first got saved, did people call you anything like that? I just, want, I just want to challenge you to think back. And so my question is, would they say that about you now? Do people in your life think that you're zealous towards the things of God? If not, you might want to reflect on what I'm going to lay out here because Paul was adamant to remind Timothy to stir up the gift of God that is in him. And I think, again, by extension, we need to sometimes stir up this gift of God that's in us. Zeal is a noun defined as passionate ardor in pursuit of an object or objective or course of action. So how does a person stir up the gift of God in themselves? That would be a good question that we should ask ourselves. And I'm hoping to give you some ideas. So let's keep reading to see if we can extract some ideas about this question. Hey, I'm going to, you know, spoiler alert. I've extracted what I think are six ideas from this chapter as to how we can stir up the gift of God. So verse seven. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Okay, so I'm going to break these things down. God has not given us the spirit of fear. In 2 Corinthians 3.17, Paul wrote, Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Paul is reminding Timothy that God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but rather we have liberty. So idea number one, to stir up the gift of God, one idea is to step fully into that liberty to avoid the spirit of fear. In other words, when you know who you are in Christ, uh, fear will just diminish in your life. And the more you step into who you are in Christ, the less room there is for fear. You know, it's kind of like if you put it into more of a physical term or you know physical terms if if jesus was you know if jesus was in the world today in a physical you know god like god manifest in the flesh don't you think that the closer you got to him the less you would be concerned about the chaos in the world All right and so spiritually speaking the same thing applies the the more you know the the more you increase your knowledge of the things of god and you know, which will impact your intimacy with the Lord Jesus Christ, the less you'll worry about what's going on in the world. Okay, so that's idea number one, power. In Romans 1.16, Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, it being the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. So idea number two is to stir up the gift of God, we can practice not being ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. So how could you practice not being ashamed of the gospel of Christ? Share it. Share it on social media. Share it with people you care about. Wear a shirt that says something. What? There's so many different ways. And the more you do that, the less you'll be ashamed of it, because you'll just get comfortable with it. Love. In 1 Timothy 1.13, Paul tells Timothy to hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith 
and love, which is in Christ Jesus. So idea number three is our love of God is stirred up by our willingness and desire to hold fast the form of sound words, which we have heard of Paul, and that doing so will stir up the gift of God in us. See the connection there? The next one is a sound mind. This is the only time this phrase is used in the Bible. That kind of surprised me, actually. So sound in this application means solidity or firmness. So, for example, um, if, if you construct something, you know, if you construct a home and somebody says, you know, this is, this is a sound construction, right? It's solid, it's firm versus, you know, if somebody just popped up a tent, you know, it's not very sound. It's not, it's not firm. So it's that kind of idea. And so again, looking at verse 13 in this chapter, Paul says, hold fast the form of sound words, hold fast. We can, so the idea, idea number four is we can stir up the gift of God in ourselves by holding fast the form of sound words, which will function to give us a sound mind. Let's keep moving. I said there's six ideas. The other two are coming. So this is eight uh, verses eight through 11. It's one sentence. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. Okay, so again, this, this is confirming Paul was in prison in Rome when he wrote this letter. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works. That's going to mess up a lot of people that try to mix the book of James with Paul's books. But according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished, abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Okay, so verse 11 makes it very clear who Paul was and should be to us today. A preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. And he's not just an apostle, because other verses in Paul's books clarify that he's the apostle of the Gentiles. Okay, so I did number five, then, is being a, par being a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel will definitely stir up the gift of God in you. There is nothing like suffering to get a person stirred up. Have you ever experienced that? It could be something as simple as, you know, you go on a, you go on a camping trip with your family, and you're all set up and you're camping and then a big, huge storm rolls in and floods everything. And it's, you know, everybody's kind of suffering a little bit and it's a little bit miserable. But then in the preceding years after that event, that family will reflect on that thing that they went through together because they suffered together. Okay. Now that's a very light example of suffering for Christ. But when you suffer for Christ, when you are a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, I guarantee you, as you look back, you will be stirred up. Verse 12, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Yeah, no one could ever accuse Paul of not being stirred up. He suffered more than any man for the gospel of Christ. Name somebody that suffered more than Paul. Uh, you're not going to find him. In fact, here are Christ's words regarding this issue. This comes from Acts 9, 16. This is Jesus Christ telling Ananias basically what Paul is made for. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Paul was built. He was ordained, if you will. His purpose in life was to suffer for the name of Christ. And he did. <laughs> I've covered that in, uh, in the book of Acts primarily about how Paul suffered. Or maybe it was the book of Romans. But at any rate, let's move on. Verse 13. Hold fast 
the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in the uh, in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. So we covered that through some of these ideas already. Verse 14, that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. That good thing likely refers to all the things Paul gave Timothy and is a direct tie uh, direct tie into Paul's exhortation in 1 Timothy 6.20. Okay, I'm not going to go back and cover all that, but if you want to understand what I'm talking about here as far as what Paul gave Timothy and the idea of keeping it, you know, keeping those things what Paul committed unto him, uh, go check out 1 Timothy 6, my, my chapter summary on, on 1 Timothy 6. Here's the link to it. And then, you know, if, if you're watching this video, it's right there on screen. Um, in fact, all, all of my chapter summaries from Acts to Philemon will be on this link pretty much forevermore. So maybe save that link. Uh, my intention is to turn this into kind of, you know, more of like a proper book at some point. But right now you can access it online with this link. All right, verse 15. This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. Paul's telling Timothy something that Timothy already knows. So he's re, you know, he's reiterating it or emphasizing it for some reason. Um, so all they were, which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. So if you, if you've, um, you know, if you ever feel like everyone is against you in your walk with the Lord, just understand that Paul experienced this in the worst possible way. And so by learning his manner of life and his doctrine, I believe that you will be profoundly encouraged. Does it happen overnight? Does it happen with one Bible reading? No, it, it takes time and effort on your part to really learn and understand Paul's manner of life and his doctrine. But when, when, you, when you start to do that, it's like this progressive relationship that you'll have with the truth and you will just become more and more encouraged no matter who's standing with you or not standing with you. Verses 16 and 17 is a sentence, but I've, I've broken it down quite a bit. Uh, the Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. I'm sure that was no small thing. And I'm sure uh, Onith, uh, Onis, Onesiphorus was, I'm sure that was just no easy thing for him. You know, to go into Rome when Rome's starting to become a very dangerous place for Christians and to seek out somebody as notorious as Paul to, un, under the guise of maybe giving him aid, you know, I don't know exactly what refreshed means, but, you know, it could be, it could mean bringing him food, change of clothes, who knows? And, and so I'm sure that it was with some degree of risk that Onesiphorus did this for Paul. Again, when you read these words, don't just be like, blah, 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 Onesiphorus did this. And Onesiphorus. Really take some time to think about like what, what was going on. Paul was a notorious prisoner in Rome. Rome was a place that wasn't friendly to Christianity. And so he's, here's Onesiphorus kind of aligning himself with Paul. Uh, I think Onesiphorus was a man's man. He was not one that was given to fear. And so really all we know of Onesiphorus is right here in this verse. He often refreshed Paul. He was not ashamed of Paul being a prisoner. He sought out Paul diligently and he found Paul. Hey, if you were in prison, especially a Roman prison, look, these are not like modern prisons today. They were often underground. They were unsanitary. Um, you oftentimes didn't get food for days. So can you imagine being Paul and being found by somebody that actually cared for you. That's intense. That's intense. Okay. I did number six. I'm sure that Onesiphorus's behavior to attend to Paul served to stir up the gift of God that was in him. And Paul concludes with what seems like a prayer for Onesiphorus or possibly a confirmation to Timothy as to who Onesiphorus was to him by saying this, the Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. I believe this is a reference to 
judgment day that all children of God are going to go through. And Paul is literally saying, Hey, I hope, I hope God almost like a, almost like a, like a special dispensation of sorts um, that Paul's asking for, for Onesiphorus. And I think it's simply, I think it's simply based upon the fact that, you know, Onesiphorus may very well have been the last person that ever cared for Paul before his beheading. And then he concludes by saying, and in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. So Tim, Timothy was, you know, knowledgeable uh, or aware um, to some degree, right? Or, you know, very well. So to some higher degree of the efforts and the work of Onesiphorus to help Paul. And so thankfully, Paul wrote about these things, and we can think about Onesiphorus in this way. You know, this was this was a man's man um, that had a lot of good characteristics that we can, you know, at least vicariously emulate in our lives. Okay. That's what I got for you. Thanks for being here. Please subscribe to the channel. Uh, I've got about a week and a half left before we get done with Philemon and uh, what a ride it has been. So thanks for being here. I hope that you have a great Bible read. Please share this channel, you know, this video with somebody that you think might get encouraged from it. And hey, I hope you have a good Bible read.